So today we're going to be learning about a different type of thermochemical calculation. It's not a calculation that involves an equation. It's a calculation you have to kind of build as you go along. It's combustion reaction calculations. And most of the time we're talking about combusting some kind of fuel in the air where there's plenty of oxygen. And oxygen is reacting with the fuel. All right. So we're talking uh, about um, chemical equations uh, that Im include the energy change. Okay, so last Friday we had a little lab where you looked at energy change when you were just dissolving a chemical. Today we're going to start looking at what are called combustion reactions. Combustion just means burning. Well, it involves them all. Okay, but this is, this is a web page you see here from uh, WebMD, and that's one kind of mole. That's not the mole we're talking about here. Yeah, how about this mole? This, this is from Vanderbilt University. It's actually a web page. They're, they're about worms. Moles apparently eat worms. Okay, that's another kind of what mole. I, ha I don't know if it has a name. I don't know anybody that's named a mole before. Not this kind of mole. All right. The kind of mole we're dealing with, the kind of mole we're dealing with is a mole uh, that has to do with uh, uh, measurements. Okay. So um, in chemistry, the mole uh, is the international system of units way of determining the amount of substance. Okay, the amount of substance. That's the definition of the mole in chemistry. Now, to a chemist, that word substance means something very specific. A substance is something that cannot be subdivided into other things except by chemical means. So it would include things like elements or compounds, okay, things that can't be subdivided into or separated except by some kind of chemical means, okay? That's what a substance is in chemistry, and it's very specific to what we do. And the mole is really important to what we do. Uh, you can't actually measure the mole directly, at least the kind of mole we're talking about here. You have to calculate it. But it, extre it is extremely important to being able to do the kind of calculations we do in chemistry. Uh, it's how we go from calculating the amount of one chemical and finding out the amount of another chemical we, that we need. You can't do that with just mass, by do, me measuring out the grams of something. You have to use the moles. You have to convert from grams to moles. And the neat thing about the mole, it kind of goes in the middle of all of this, okay? You can go from mass to moles and moles to liters and moles to um, uh, solution co concentration and moles to volume, okay, for a gas. So it allows you to do all these different kinds of calculations or, co or uh, conversions from one measurement unit to another. What we're going to be using it today for is the basis for calculating the amount of energy given off or taken in by a chemical reaction. Not just dissolving something as we did on Friday, but actually a chemical reaction. So you have a reference sheet in front of you with a set of values uh, that we're going to be using. Make sure you have this. Okay. Now let's talk about what it's going to uh, be used for, how we'll, how we'll use that, okay? Now, when you were taking physical science, you um, learned to balance equations. In chemistry, we call it balancing by inspection. Later on, we'll learn a more, comp more, more uh, complete way of balancing equations that allows you to balance some equations that are kind of hard to do otherwise, okay? It helps you to keep up with everything. But if you were balancing an equation where we were combusting hydrogen gas, and hydrogen gas um, is a very volatile gas, okay? You, you, you put a match to it, if there's enough oxygen around, well, if you've got the right mixture of hydrogen gas and oxygen, you're going to get a pretty powerful flame, uh, maybe even an explosion. So if we're balancing an equation where we're combusting hydrogen gas, this is the symbol for hydrogen gas, 
hydrogen gas is one of the diatomic gases, meaning it's it, you don't find it as just H. You find it as H sub 2, where one hydrogen atom is bonded to another. And since this is a gas, we're going to write the symbol G for gas. And we're going to show how we're going to react that with oxygen in this chemical equation. Oxygen is also diatomic. It generally doesn't exist in nature as a single atom. It's bonded to itself once. In the upper atmospheres, you'll find concentrations of O3. That's called ozone. But you don't have a lot of it in this room. In fact, it would be very bad for you if we did. If there's a lot of pollution in the air, uh, as we get sometimes, not much around here, but in some places, then you get a lot of ozone, which is damaging to your lungs. Can we put away the cell phones, please? Thank you. And then if we're reacting those together, what we get is water. Now, if I were to look at this, this equation is not balanced. There are more oxygen atoms on the left than there are on the right. And just to leave it like this would violate the law of conservation of mass. Okay? What we want to do is to make sure we have a balanced number of atoms on both sides. And so we'll put a 2 here and a 2 here. And that will give us the equal number of oxygen atoms and hydrogen atoms on both sides of the equation. And that's a balanced equation. Okay? But this doesn't tell us what's happening with the energy. If we include energy in the equation, so we get uh, 571.68 kilojoules of energy if I react two moles of hydrogen. Now, let's talk about what that means for a second. Um, when you were in physical science and learning to balance equations by inspection, you were told this was two molecules. But in order to use it effectively, what we need to do, remember if you multiply one side of an equation by something, you also have to multiply the other side of the equation with the same thing. But what we can do is multiply two by the mole. And what we get is uh, 12.044 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. I know. Don't worry about it. But anyway, the point is, the point is that as long as I have this multiplied by the mole, and this multiplied by the mole, and this multiplied by the mole, I've done the same thing to both sides. Okay? So we can treat this like a mole. And that's what this kilojoules of energy is about. For two kilojoules of hydrogen gas, hydrogen molecules... Okay, for, I'm sorry, not two kilojoules, two moles of hydrogen gas. We get this many kilojoules of energy out when I react it with oxygen. I burn it. That's what combustion is, just burning. And usually it's burning with the oxygen in the air. The air has about 21 21% oxygen. Okay, so there's plenty of oxygen around. All right, so when we're dealing with combustion, most of the time we're talking about what happens in the air. Okay, now. The kinds of chemical equations we do in combustion chemistry are a little bit different than the kind of chemical equations you do anywhere else. So in this unit, we're going to write balanced equations in a way that you can't do any, any, any other time in the semester. Okay? What we want to do is to have just one mole of our fuel. This is the fuel, and this is the oxidizer. Okay? So to have one mole of Hydrogen gas, I've got to divide everything by two. Remember, if I do it to one side, I have to do it to the other, right? So as long as I do it to one side, I can do it to the other. I should do it to the other. So that would give me H2 plus, I'm going to divide this by one half. What am I going to have? One. And one half of one is one half. Not a trick question. Okay. Yeah, there's an implied one there. Just like if I had X on the paper in algebra, there's an implied one there. It's 1X, one yes. Okay. All right. Now that's going to give us... There's my hydrogen here. 285.84 kilojoules of heat energy. Most Well, some of it's light. Most of it's heat. Okay. All right. So, where is this energy coming from? Well, in terms of what we talked about last week, there's the system, there's the surroundings, and all together it makes up universe. Good. So we got the system, 
and anything around the system is the surroundings. And all together, all of it makes up the universe. Okay? This energy is coming from the system. These chemicals make up this system. Okay? All these, the, the hydrogen, the oxygen, the water, ga the, ga the steam, the water in the form of gas make up this system here. Okay? So energy is leaving the system and going to the surroundings. Okay? And so when we put the energy over here in the reaction, this is the energy that's being delivered to the surroundings. And we call this the pr a product. Anything on the right-hand side is a product. Anything on the left-hand side is a reactant. So when we write an equation like this, this energy is a product. And the thing you've got to remember is that when we write the energy in the equation like this, it's a product delivered to the surroundings. Okay? Because you can't measure the energy in the system itself. You've got to move it to the surroundings to even know it's there. Yes? Are we all going to divide by two, right? No. What you're trying to do is to get the fuel to have a coefficient of 1. And we don't write coefficients of 1, so it's an implied 1. Okay? So we're, we don't always divide by 2, but we want equations in combustion chemistry to always have the fuel, not the oxygen, the fuel have a coefficient of 1. Okay? Does that make sense? All right. Now here's the problem. Most of the time, it's not really a problem, most of the time, when we're writing these kinds of equations, we don't write the equation so that energy is delivered as a product. What we're doing is writing an equation that shows the energy change in the system. Well, if this amount of energy is going to the surroundings, what amount of energy change is there in the system? System to surroundings, go one place or the other. I have a fixed amount of energy in the universe. If I deliver this amount of energy to the surroundings, that's the product. What's the energy change in the system? Negative that. It's not a trick question. Yeah, it's got to move out. That's right. It's got to move out. Okay? So here's, here's how we write these equations to show the change in the system. Okay? Remember this delta H term? Or symbol we used last week? Enthalpy. It's the ch deltas that change. So it's change in enthalpy. And this delta H term is the enthalpy in the system, not the surroundings. Okay? Delta H, we think of in high school, it's not really this exactly. But in high school, we think of delta H as being the change of stored energy in the system. Okay? So the energy that was stored in the bonds of these chemicals is being delivered to the surroundings when this reaction moves forward. And what we're doing here is showing the amount of energy change inside the system. Okay? And so that is a negative 285.84 kilojoules. Okay? Say what? There's a plus sign here. There's no plus sign over here. Oh, here? No, no, no. We don't put a plus sign here. We're breaking this out as a separate thing. Okay? It's like it's joined to this, but not actually combined. You know, it just it hangs around with it. Okay? Yeah? What's the unit Kilojoules. K, small k, capital J. Does everybody know what kilo means? It's a thousand of the wh whatever the base unit is. If joules is the base unit, then this is a thousand of those base units. Okay? What's a milli mean? M I L L I. Uh, no, it's not a million. What's a milli? It's not your girlfriend. You spell that M I L L I E. It's a joke. <laughs> I was talking to Anderson over there, you know. All right. I don't know. I don't know what Anderson's girlfriend's name is. I'm just kidding. All right. Huh? Kilojoules. Okay. Millie is one thousandth. Oh, I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. 
Okay. One thousandth. You need to know those prefixes. Okay. So there are a thousand millijoules in a joule and a thousand joules in a kilojoule. A thousand joules in a kilojoule and a thousand millijoules in a joule. Okay, you need to know those prefixes. A thousand grams in a kilogram, a thousand milligrams in a gram. Hmm? A thousand moles in a kilomole, a thousand millimoles in a mole. And what do you kill them all with? Okay. Yeah, this, yeah, yeah, whack them all there, yeah. All right. All right. All right, let's look at one of the ways, a real simplified way that we can actually use this information, okay? So while I'm writing this problem, let me tell you that the mole is so important to what we do in chemistry that we have a day of celebration for it. You heard that? It's called Mole Day. And it happens on October 23rd. That does say, and that was a year when October 23rd fell on a weekend, so I moved the day around to be able to celebrate it during the week. Really? So this year, uh, Mall Day will fall on a weekday, and so we'll just celebrate on October 23rd. Hmm? Yes, you need to write this down. I'm going to show you how to solve this problem as an example. Now, um, in fact, I'm trying to work it out uh, on October 18th, a Saturday. Um, if you guys want to earn some extra credit on your grade for this nine weeks, you can do demonstrations, chemistry demonstrations, at the Spartanburg Science Center. Oh, no. <laughs> no, you don't want to do that? Okay, all right. I'm just saying, it's a, it's a pop. There are other opportunities to do extra credit, okay? Don't, don't worry about it. There's plenty of opportunities for extra credit, all right? But if that's something you would be interested in, I'll see if I can work it out, okay? We used to do it at the mall, but now they're doing it at the Spartanburg Science Center. And if I can get everything sort of squared away, Anyway, uh, you can do, yeah, you could, I suppose. It, but here's the, 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 what you have to do is decide what you're going to do. You set it up. I'll give you the, any of the chemicals you need to work it out for you. Um, but you decide what you want to do your demonstration on. You can work with one other student and only one other student. Okay. Um, but you have to also, in addition to actually doing the demonstration for the, all, all, all the points you can get, you have to be able to explain uh, to little kids and adults the chemistry involved. Explain to them at their level. Huh? You could, I mean, I don't, I, I don't know. I've got to find out if we can do, um, what's it called? Um, burning things and exploding things. I don't know if we can do that there or not. The city of Spartanburg is pretty, pretty, pretty um, cautious about that. Story. All right. All right. Okay. So uh, what's the starting amount here? It stands alone. In fact, there's nothing else there. Okay. So that what, what, we, what we do with our starting amount here, if we're going to convert it into, into something. Well, we would write an equality statement if we had an equality statement. In this case, there is no equality statement. This is the case where there isn't. I'm going to show you what that means later. 
But right now, let's just look at what our starting amount is. What do you do with the starting amount in a problem when you're trying to change it into something else? Put it over 1. That's what I think. Really? Okay. Yeah, we don't run an equality. That's an equality statement. We don't want to do that. That's when we build a conversion unit. This is going to have a conversion, but it's not a conversion unit. We can't really write an equality statement and be fair. Put it over 1. All right, now. Normally, then, we require an equality statement from which we build a conversion unit. But what we have here, when we convert from moles of this into energy, we don't have a true equality. And so what you're going to do is you have to have a balanced equation to write uh, this conversion factor. Okay? But what we're going to use is this. What you need to know is that this infers that. Or actually, this implies that you infer it. Okay, you need to know that if the if the system is giving away energy, this represents the energy lost by the system. This way of writing is the energy gained by the surroundings, and that's the product. So, if we're looking what's going to be produced or the product, then we want a positive number here. It's not always a positive number. If this is a positive number, that's a negative number. And if you're asking about what's happening as a product or something being produced, what you're interested in is what energy is going to the surroundings. If you're asking about what energy change is there in the system, well then you look at what, it, what this, this number is right here. It's actually, it might be a negative number, whatever's represented here. Okay? You gotta keep up with whether you're, you're looking at a product or producing something, that's the surroundings. Or the energy change in the system and keep up with uh, what sign you need to use. One is the opposite. It's always the opposite side. One's the opposite side of the other. Okay? In this case, it's this because we're talking about what's being delivered to the surroundings. Products go to the surroundings. So, what we, what we have here is this is kilojoules per mole. Okay? And when we put in the equation here, this is this many kilojoules for every mole of this. This is actually kilojoules per mole here. Okay? So, it basically gives us the conversion we need for this, only it has to be the opposite sign of this one. Because we're talking about what's being be delivered to the surroundings. What? Alright, so it's 285.84 kilojoules per mole, and per mole of what? Per mole of this stuff. H2. That's the fuel. Okay? So if you look on the reference sheet, it says there's kilojoules per mole. It just doesn't say what the chemical is until you get down here and you have to look over this way and find what chemical applies to that number. Okay? All right, now we're ready to do the math. That's all there is to this math. Pretty simple once you learn to set it up. Yeah, it's not hard once you figure out how to set it up. So the units we have left are kilojoules. I have to write that with this number. Now what else do I need to do, if anything? Simplify? What does that mean? Um, help me out. Because I simplified when I did this. Significant digits. How many significant digits do I need in the final answer? Three. That's because this has five digits, but the, but the number with the least digits, the measured or calculated number with the least digits is this one. Trailing zeros are significant if there's a decimal place. <coughs> so since I have three significant digits, I need to underline everything else, the insignificant digits. So one, two, three, those are the significant digits. Everything else is insignificant. Okay, what do I do next? Okay. I, why do I have to move the decimal? Well, the main, the, the real, I, I agree with you, that's true, but the biggest thing is, anytime you're getting rid of a number in the ones place, then you have to write your answer in scientific notation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we move our decimal place to between the first and second significant digit. <coughs> and that's three places to the left.
Okay? <coughs> Excuse me. All right, now I'm going to give you a practice problem and you can work with a learning partner near you. Solve this problem by yourself if you want to or with a learning partner. I highly encourage you to work with a learning partner. And then I will um, I will come back and show you the solution at the end. So, so let's solve the problem now. What's our standalone amount? What's our starting amount? 5.00 moles of ethanol. In this formula right here, or in this, the, the, the chart, the um, sort of a table, it's not a table because it's not complete, but uh, we've got this formula. If you look at this equation, oxygen is the oxidizer. You know what O2 is. CO2 is carbon dioxide. You should know that when you see it. And that's water. You should know that when you see it. So this is the only thing left that could be ethanol. Besides that, the fuel is always listed first in combustion reactions. So that's our formula, C2H5OH. And so since that's our starting amount, our standalone amount, we put it over 1. We're going to look at the equation now, given to you here. And it says that for every mole of ethanol burned, the system loses 1368 kilojoules of energy. Okay? What now? Well, you end up multiplying by 5 in the problem, but not yet. What we do is we're going to take this this right here, this 1 mole, and put it on the bottom where 1 mole is indicated here. Okay? And this many kilojoules only, since we're talking about products, what's produced, that's what's happening in the surroundings. And so instead of being a negative number, that's what's happening in the system. What we want is the amount of energy going to the surroundings. Well, that's just the inverse of that, the, the uh, uh, additive inverse. And so what we have then is uh, 1368, a positive number, kilojoules over one mole of this same species because that's the fuel for this particular reaction. Yeah, I, I'd have to give you the number somewhere. You're not going to memorize a bunch of uh, enthalpies of, of reactions. No. I mean, I could, I suppose, make you do that, but I'm not going to do that. I, yeah. All right, cancel out what you can cancel out. Things that are the same on the top and bottom can be canceled. Do the math. Five times thirteen sixty eight. It's sixty eight forty. The units we have left after we cancel what we can cancel is kilojoules. We need to figure out significant digits. There are three significant digits here, four here, so we want the least digits in our final answer of the measured and calculated numbers. This is a measured number. Actually, it's a cal both these are actually calculated. Um, but of the measured or calculated numbers, we look at which one is has the least digits, and that's how many digits we have in our final answer. That's the rule for multiplication and division. And so we've got to underline the last digit here. These three digits are significant. The zero is not significant. So if we're getting rid of a number in the ones place, we've got to move our decimal place over and write it in scientific notation. Kilojoules.
Well, good. I don't know, can you? No. <laughs> and this is only the first of two homework problems. All right, so let's um, look at one of these chemical equations we're working with. You make it as big as you want. You can make it smaller than mine. It's your, it's your notes, so it's fine with me anyway to do it. Okay? That's hard too. Mm -hmm. No, just do your best you can. Okay. No, okay. <laughs> so, energy was what? Given away or taken in in this reaction? We did this one. Well, we did it earlier, see? This is the same one I just wrote down here and here. It's given away to the surroundings, okay? So it's leaving the system and going to the surroundings, okay? So this graph is going to look at what's happening in the system, okay? This is called a reaction energy diagram. If I were asking you to write this in the form that we use in labs, when we do labs and we write, we come up with these graphs, the form that we'd write it in is, we'd say that uh, the energy um, change in the system as this chemical reaction progresses. Okay? Anything on the left-hand side, those are reactants. Anything on the right-hand side, those are called products. And so as we go from left to right, this is the reaction progress. We're progressing from left to right. We're changing from our starting stuff, our reactants, to our ending stuff, our products. Yep. And so since we're looking at the change in the system, and that, that symbol is delta H. What I want to look at first is a reaction energy diagram for this kind of reaction, which is giving away energy. That means that the surroundings are feeling warmer or hot. Okay? What kind of name or label do we put on a change that gives energy away to where you are, that feels warmer to where you are? Well, it is the surroundings, but I mean, there's a name for this kind of reaction when it feels warm, it gives away energy, it gives away heat. 
not endothermic, exothermic. Okay, so we're looking at what is an exothermic reaction. So this is for an exothermic reaction. Okay? All right. If energy is being given away to the surroundings when we burn this, um, then what is happening to the delta H in the system? We kind of looked at that already. The delta H of the system is negative. So the amount of energy is going to be lower at the end or higher at the end? Lower. That's how it's negative. Okay. If it's negative, it's going down. Remember the slope of a line that tilts down like that is negative, and a slope of a line that goes up is positive? Okay. So if we start high, we've got to end low if it's going to be endothermic. If we start high, we've got to end low for an, endoth I mean an exothermic reaction. It's going to give away energy to the surroundings. Because this is the change in the stored energy, which is what we're going to be treating delta H to mean. Okay? Hmm? Yeah, I'll probably cover it up with something else in a minute. All right. Now, <clears throat> if I'm going to take, we used butane a moment ago. No, you used ethanol. We did use it, butane, didn't we? No, that was butane homework. Oh, homework, okay. Uh, Y'all know where you use butane? No. No, it's not hair products. You don't know where to use, where they use butane? I hope nobody in here uses butane very much, but it's pretty common. Okay. <coughs> now, when I put, if I take butane instead of hydrogen and put it with oxygen, does it automatically just light up? You've got to generate, you've got to generate a spark to get it started. Now, a spark is energy. So what we do to get this reaction going is we're actually going to add some energy to this system to move it in this direction. So that eventually it does give away energy overall, but it's got to start with some added energy. Does that make sense? All reactions require some additional energy because the molecules have to bang into each other. Okay, you have to get the mo molecules or the bonds that are holding this molecule together to loosen up, and the mo and the bonds that hold this molecule together loosen up and to rearrange into this form. Okay, so you can't just put them together and you suddenly get some kind of reaction. That almost never happens. You've got to get them to bang into each other, loosen up, and reform into this. Okay, so that's what that spark is all about. It's getting those molecules started. Now, in this particular case because it's an exothermic reaction, once you start it, it generates more heat, which starts the next set, which starts the next set, which starts the next set. And it's a kind of a chain reaction. Okay? But first, we've got to add some energy to the system in order to get it started. Whoa! All right. So the overall change in enthalpy is the difference between where we started and where we ended. The overall change in enthalpy doesn't include this because overall means from beginning to end. Okay? So the amount of delta H change, or the amount of H change, because delta means change, is the difference between the amount of energy stored in the system we started with and the amount of energy stored in the system when we ended up. So the difference between here and here, there's our delta H.
Delta H is change in enthalpy. Enthalpy for high school can be thought of as energy stored in the system. Okay. So that's the overall change. But we do have this other change. And this other change between wherever we're starting from and wherever we go up to, that's our change in something else, something we had to add to it. Okay, put on your creative hats here. And tell me what kind of name could we come up with to describe adding energy here to make it go? What kind of name? Well, endothermic means we're giving away energy over. I mean, you're gaining energy overall in the system because it feels cool. It's taking energy from the surroundings. But what would this amount of energy we added? What can we call that? Extra energy. Could call it that. Call it anything else, huh? I'm not looking for the correct answer. I'm looking for an answer, whatever fits what you the way you think. Not needed energy. It is needed. It's needed to start the reaction moving forward. Extra energy. Okay, that's what she said. Anybody else got another name for it? No. You said. Energy is not calculated. There you go. That's another name for it. Okay. Look, here's what I'm trying to get you to do. You know the term engage. What does that mean? I'm listening to you. I'm looking around at anybody who's giving me an answer. All right? Okay, then, fine. Be that way. All right. If, if we use that word engage. Okay, interact. Okay, you're playing a game, you're engaged, okay? What? Focused, okay, being engaged that way. That means kind of being locked in, okay? You know, you use the term engaged when you're talking about getting married, right? Huh? That's kind of like locked in. It's a promise to marry. Well, originally it meant I promised to marry. It's being locked in. Okay? In mechanics, engaging refers to putting taking the parts of a um, a gear engaging with another part of a gear. Okay? Um, and what I'm trying to get you guys to do is engage with this learning by coming up with these ideas yourself of what it means. If you're engaging with the idea, you're also you also should be able to give me some kind of name to describe what we're talking about here. Even if it's not the right idea, I want to give you a name. But I want you to come up with a kind of mental definition for yourself of what it means when I give you this word to describe this or phrase to describe this. So if you come up with it first, you understand the idea, and now we can put a label on it that you're more likely to hold on to. So if you're just waiting for me to give you a name, you're not planning for success. You've got to engage in this, in this activity in order to be more equipped to be successful in the test. All right. The amount of energy change from what we started with to the top of this energy hill. That's the energy required to get the reaction started. This is called activation energy. Now, if I tell you activation energy is the energy required to add, you, energy required to be added to a system to re make a react, chemical reaction start and move forward, that's a bunch of words. But if you don't have a concept of what it means, it's not helping you very much. That's why I'm getting you to try to tell me what this what this thing is here before I give you a definition with words that don't have any real meaning to you. Okay? You got to make meaning for yourself. You got to connect this new knowledge to what you already know. Okay?
in this case then delta H in this example is negative because it's losing energy okay so some of you in the in the um, lab we did last Friday no last Friday we did a lab where some of you had some energy that wasn't given away. Okay, some of you did some uh, a reaction where you didn't have energy given away. Okay, this is energy being given away. The system is losing energy, so the energy is being given away to the surroundings. What would it look like if energy was being taken in from the surroundings and put into the system? How would that be different? Huh? Okay. It'd be. It'd be. It would. I think what you mean is instead of starting high and going low, low and go high. Okay, and that's true. That's how you get a positive delta H if you change the energy by putting energy from or moving energy from the surroundings into that system. Okay. So we have to, in this case, then, start low and end high. Okay? So this is the progressive reaction down here. Okay? We've got the change in enthalpy in the system or change of stored energy in the system over here. This is just another of the reaction energy diagrams. But in this case, if we're going to gain energy in the system, that energy has to come from the surroundings. It's not going to be exothermic. Endothermic. Okay. <laughs> and what do you think this activation energy hill is going to look like? So it's got to be up because you got to add energy to get it started. <laughs> you still have to add energy to get it started, even when it's endothermic. Now, it might just be movement energy, getting the molecules moving around fast enough to bang into each other. <coughs> Sometimes, because of other things going on, too much movement around is not going to be it's not going to help. It's going to actually make it more difficult. <laughs> Okay. In this case, the amount of energy added to get it started is still the activation energy. It just looks like a bigger, taller arrow here. Okay. And the difference between the starting amount of energy, the overall energy change, the difference between the starting energy and the ending energy, just as before, is the change in delta H. It's still the change in the energy in the system. In this case, delta H is not going to be negative because we're adding energy to the system. We're moving it upwards here. So 
the delta H is positive. your notes. It's a new graph, but it's, it's kind of added to the old one, but it's helpful if you have a new graph. All right. All right, so this is uh, back to our original exothermic reaction what I want to look at now is the effect of a catalyst what is a catalyst it doesn't slow it down it's, yeah it has the effect of speeding it up okay it's not always that but usually it has the effect of speeding it up there are biological catalysts. You know what the name of those are? Um, what? Enzymes. Oh. Enzymes are biological catalysts. Okay. There are catalysts in your car. It, well, I don't know. Every car has a catalytic converter. You don't know about that? A catalytic converter. Okay. So the purpose of a catalyst, while it has the effect of speeding up a reaction, the reason it speeds up a reaction has everything to do with this, this energy hill, this reaction energy diagram, what's happening with the energy in the system. Okay. If I want to speed up this reaction, let's think of it kind of like a roller coaster. I want to speed up this reaction. Where's the slow part of the reaction? Going up the hill. Because that's always crank, 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 crank up the hill. Yes? Okay, that's the slow part. If I could, how about I speed that up? Huh? With a catalyst, okay. Well, in terms of this hill, how would I speed up getting from here to here? Add more force? That's not what a catalyst does. How, how else might you speed up going from here to here? Well, you could, but that would be adding more force. It's kind of the same thing. Because not even go up the hill. Oh, she's saying go straight from here to here. Well, that's not possible. But what a catalyst does is reduce the, the height of the hill. Okay? That's what a catalyst does. It reduces the height of the hill. It makes it easier. And we said those molecules have to bang into each other. You have to loosen up the bonds and reform bonds. The catalyst makes it easier uh, to, for those bonds to be loosened up and the new bonds to form. Okay? Yeah. Right? 
that's the effect of a catalyst. It lowers the activation energy required to move the reaction forward. That's one of the homework problems.